In this module, we'll examine inflection points and their relationship to concave and convex functions. In module one, I mentioned inflection points in the context of stationary points. It's worthwhile remembering that while some stationary points are inflection points, not all inflection points are stationary points. So what is an inflection point? An inflection point is a point on a function where the second derivative changes sign. Say point C is an inflection point on some open interval AB. Either the second derivative is positive on AC and negative on CB, or the second derivative is negative on AC and positive on CB. In other words, an inflection point is where the function changes from being concave to convex or vice versa. In this example, going from left to right, the function goes from being convex to being concave. We have an inflection point somewhere here, and we'll see how to find that inflection point later. Remember, when a function is convex, the second derivative is greater than zero, and when it's concave, the second derivative is less than zero. An inflection point that you will most likely have come across before, perhaps without knowing it, is the so-called bell-shaped curve, or more precisely, the probability density function for a normal distribution. The probability density function, or PDF, is the line that defines the normal distribution. This is the actual function here. We can see in the middle of the distribution the function is concave, and in its tails, it's convex. So we have an inflection point on each side of the distribution. The amazing thing is that the inflection points are exactly one standard deviation either side of the mean. Ponder that for a moment if you will. It's one of those amazing facts that makes maths somewhat cosmic if you think about it for a while. Well, that's probably long enough to think about it. Let's see how we can test for an inflection point. To test for an inflection point, first we find the second derivative, and then we find any points where it's equal to zero. These are potential inflection points. We must also test whether the second derivative changes sign at this point. The second derivative equaling zero is a necessary but not sufficient condition for an inflection point. Here's another way of expressing the second derivative test for an inflection point. We know the necessary condition is that the second derivative at point C is equal to zero. We can express the fact that the second derivative changes sign in terms of the third derivative. So the third derivative is how the second derivative changes. If the third derivative is negative, then the second derivative is going from positive to negative and the function goes from being convex to concave. If the third derivative is positive, then the second derivative will go from negative to positive, and the function will go from concave to convex. If the third derivative is equal to zero, our test is inconclusive. We'll work through this example to illustrate the test for an inflection point. Here's our function, x cubed minus x squared plus two. First, let's look at the domain. So we'll have x, it's an element of the domain, equal to the real number line. The first derivative, f prime x, is equal to 3x squared minus 2x. The first order condition, the first derivative is equal to 0, implies that 3x squared minus 2x is equal to 0. Oh, we could have x times 3x minus 2 is equal to 0. So it's easy to see our stationary points are at x equals 0 and x equals 2 on 3. The second root of f prime prime x is equal to well, 6x minus 2. The necessary condition for an inflection point is the second derivative equals 0. So we'll have f prime prime x is equal to 6x minus 2 is equal to 0. That implies x equals 1 third. We have our stationary points and possible inflection point. Let's draw a sine diagram to analyze the function around these points. We have our number line x with the stationary points and the potential inflection points noted. To find the signs of the first derivative, let's evaluate the first derivative, either side of the stationary points, 
say plus one, plus one half, and somewhere out here, minus one. And that will give us the signs of our first derivative. So the first derivative at minus one will equal, well, minus one times three times minus one, minus two, all in brackets. Well, it's equal to five, so that's positive. At one half, the first derivative will be one half times three times one half minus two. That's equal to minus one quarter, that's minus. At x equals one, the first derivative will be one times three times one minus two, and that's equal to plus one. So we plus. We can put those signs in. Now we have our sign diagram for the first derivative. What's happening to fx? Well, about zero. Our first derivative is going from positive to negative. It's concave. At about two thirds, the first derivative goes from negative to positive. So the function is convex. Now let's look at the sign diagram for the second derivative. We know the second derivative is equal to zero at x equals one third. At values of x less than one third, the second derivative is negative. At values of x greater than one third, the second derivative is positive. We see that the second derivative changes sign at x equals one third so we have an inflection point. So we can see from our sign diagram the relationship between the sign of the first derivative, the sign of the second derivative, and the convexity and concavity of the original function. This is what the function looks like. We have the two stationary points at x equals zero and x equals two thirds, and the inflection point between them at x equals one third. Around the local maximum, the function is concave. And around the local minimum, the function is convex. This example leads us to a general definition of convexity and concavity that's related to the one that we developed in lecture four. So here we're looking at a chord rather than the secant. If we have a chord or a line segment joining any two points of a graph and it's below the graph, our function is concave. If we have a chord joining any two points on a function and the chord is above the graph, our function is convex. We've seen how this definition relates to the first and second derivatives. Remember, this was our definition of convexity from lecture four. Basically, we're saying the same thing here in algebraic terms as we're saying here graphically. Strictly speaking, this definition includes the possibility that the function is a straight line which is both concave and convex. So we can have a definition for strictly concave and strictly convex functions. If the second derivative is negative for all x in the interval a, b, then our function is strictly concave. If the second derivative is positive for all values of x in the interval a, b, then our function is strictly convex over a, b. We'll finish this lecture with an economic example of an optimization problem. Now go to the video for example 8 to see how we solve it.